Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. I'm also the CEO founder of Cabinet's HR. At Cabinet's HR, we deliver, we deliver HR to companies before and for your people. Our guest today is Greg Bennett. Greg, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I like doing a uh, live interaction. This yeah. is pretty fun. I don't get to do this very often. Yes, yes. So we're going to do a deep dive of everything you're doing in a few minutes. But right now, can you kind of talk about like what you do for fun, your hobbies, and what you kind of do, like, you know, kind of take care of yourself? Of course, absolutely. So my uh, my one of my biggest passions in life has always been coin collecting. And when I say that, people think, you know, putting pennies in a book. But I do a lot with coins. I'm, I sit on the board of two national coin organizations. I have three different articles, regular articles that I write for three different publications, coin publications. So I do a lot of uh, research, thinking, and exploration of coins, specifically error coins, coins that were struck twice by accident, struck off center by mistake, that kind of thing, or what are called counter stamps. In the early, uh, to, in the mid to late 1800s, it was very common for businesses to stamp their name into existing coins. So for example, if there was a barber, you might get a half dollar in change that said, Jason Kavnis, Barber, Seattle, stamped into the coin. So if I needed somebody to shave my head, I knew where to go in 1860, that kind of thing. So they're called counter stamps. And that's what my focus is, error coins and counter stamps. So if I'm not sitting across from you and you ever wonder where I am, I'm either sitting at home collecting, reading about researching or thinking or talking about coins. So Greg, what's your take? I think this comes up like maybe two or three years. You want to get rid of pennies, right? Absolutely. Things to get rid of. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we should get rid of them. And the reason we should get rid of them, there's a couple of reasons for people who don't know the issue. There's a lot of discussion about getting rid of pennies, meaning the pennies we use every day, just making them go away. There's a precedent for that. Canada got rid of their cents. The reason that we should do it is not because we want to be like the Canadians, although on some respects in terms of healthcare and other things, maybe we do. But the reason to do it is because it costs way more than a penny to make a penny. It costs way more than a nickel to make a nickel. So we are losing money with every penny we make. And in addition, the pennies that we make end up in jars at your house, my house, your grandmother, my grandma, whomever, and they don't get used. So then they go through this process of coin star being reintroduced to circulation, being put back in jars at home and never really get used. So the mint keeps making pennies, which costs more than a penny a piece to make, and they keep filling up jars. It's this weird cycle of coins that are not really used for anything being saved and made that are expensive. Absolutely get rid of the penny. Round up to the nearest nearest nickel on everything. Round down to the nearest nickel on everything if you choose. I mean, the argument can be made to get rid of nickels too, but that's a more expensive proposition. But definitely the pennies are an absolute losing venture we should get rid of them and how long have you been doing this coin collecting thing uh ever since i was about nine years old uh, okay. seven years old you know but but i really got into it around age 10 or so i think what's been like maybe the most expensive the rarest coin you've come across well i came across something without going into extraordinary detail which might actually bore watchers and listeners there were two coins that were struck laying on top of each other in the 1800s um that were struck at the same time by accident and i discovered this pair of coins that were struck together at the same time so when I say I discovered it, it's not like I had a time machine and went back in time and discovered these things. I um, very, along with everybody else, had every chance in the world to see these things at auction. I saw that there was something unusual about them. Everyone else missed the fact that they were a very specific type of coins that were struck on top of each other, and that's where their value was. So it was more the rarity than anything else that really appealed to me than, than the value. Because in the United States, we focus a lot on the value of things but other places in the world focus on the aesthetic of things, that they're beautiful, that they're rare, they're unique, they're exciting, they're attractive. In the United States, we focus almost exclusively on value when it comes to collectibles, and we lose out as a result. I mean, the Europeans are deeply interested in, in aesthetics. We're, we're interested in value. It's, it's just a cultural affect, much to, our, uh, much to our disintegration as a culture in some ways. So I know you always hear about like, people counterfeiting like, like the paper money, right? I'm guessing it's too hard to counterfeit coins. They're probably not worth the worth well, the, what both, they do, right? Both, both are hard, right? If you and I decide today that we want to become counterfeiters, which I think is a bad idea, um, we're going to have a hard time. The paper is unique. The printing process is unique and quite extensive and intricate. We're not going to be able to make bills the way people think that they can. That's why they get caught and go to prison. Coins is even tougher because you've got to make the planchets, the blanks, You've got to come up with the dies. You have to have a machine that the dies fit into that strikes the coins. And then those struck coins have to be struck at a pressure that makes them look authentic and 
fills the design of the of the uh, of the, the of the die. This is not easy to do. So let's not of all the things we might talk about and do today, let's not become counterfeiters. I think it's a bad idea. Yeah, I, I watched a show on CNN. I can't remember the name, but it's this lady. She goes like all these different bad people. Like she'll go like see smugglers, drug smugglers, whatever. One time the episode of I think it was a country in Peru, like how they counterfeit money, right? The whole process, right? It was like really. I hate to say interesting because I don't like encourage anyone, but like it was very like, man, like this is some deep scientific stuff. Well, it's fascinating. I mean, it can be fascinating, right? I mean, we watch movies like Catch Me If You Can and movies about people who have lived lives of crime, not because we want to be them, but because it's fascinating. And we're glad we're not them, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, we don't want to be in prison and or on the run from the law. But it can be interesting to read about how counterfeiters take these risks and do these things. I yeah. mean, you know, you know, show like Narcos was was interesting to people, not because they wanted to become Pablo Escobar, but because they were glad they weren't him, you know, and they exactly, yeah. watch from afar. So I always thought, you know, counterfeiters, you know, like they're kind of fake, like, you know, maybe copy dollar bills, print, like they had like, I mean, it's like really scientific stuff they're doing, right? This like, is scientific. Like, whoa, like, yeah. 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 And, and I can't speak with authority because I'm not a counterfeiter, neither are you, and no. we won't be one today. But uh, the point is, is that a lot goes into the making of coins and a lot goes into the making of bills. That, that people don't realize there's, you know, you know, even like I mentioned the paper, I mean, the paper that our bills are printed on is a very special type of paper. There's fibers woven into it to prevent counterfeiting. It's not like the U S government has an amazing contract with FedEx <laughs> Kinko's, you know what I'm saying? And they're doing these things by the hundreds of thousands of reams as they're making $500 bills. Yeah. It's a lot to it. So, yeah. yeah. And so I think I saw a picture of you on the internet somewhere. We went skydiving. I did. I can, went skydiving. That was that recently or a long time it, ago? It was two years ago, and can it was amazing. That? That's Absolutely. the first time you went. Yeah, it was the first time I ever went. That's my bucket list. I want to go skydiving. I yeah. highly recommend it. There's some things that I recommend you not do: mm -hmm. counterfeiting. Yeah. There's some things I recommend you do do: sky yeah. skydiving. So I made a promise to myself that I would go skydiving at some point in my life. I think that a lot of people have that as a bucket a bucket list item. So I decided I wanted to go skydiving. And I went up to Snohomish. There's a number of places that do skydiving in the Pacific Northwest. And I went up to uh, a place in Snohomish and I, I got, I was really scared because I had put it off for a year, put it off for another year and finally went up and I was like, am I really going to do this? Did you go by yourself? I went by myself. Okay. See, I would do the same thing because I'd be afraid I would chicken out. If I'm with my friends and family, I'd chicken out from my friends and family. If I chicken out. I want to be there by myself. That's right. And you'd come up with any excuse too. So let's say you walk in with your cousin, Larry, and all of a sudden Larry's like, you know what? I kind of got a headache. You'd go, okay, cool. Let's not do this today. So I went up skydiving by myself and I walk in and you fill out an extensive disclaimer. That's not just like, Hey, you're going to be on the Jason Cavanis experience. You might get your, your microphone might hit you in the face backs and then you'll spill water in your lap. It was like, you could die getting into the plane, getting out of the plane, falling from the plane, thinking about the plane. It was not, it was not an easy read, right? But you have to check them all off. Like you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Uh, and then you can get on the plane and the plane is a plane about the size of this room. It's a tiny plane. So as you're going up in this plane, you're thinking I might not survive the plane ride, but everyone else has. So maybe I will. And then I was in the, in kind of the back as people are skydiving out before me. And you could go at 10,000 feet or 13,500. And I opted, you know, I figured 13,500. If I'm going to fall to my death. You're look, there anyway, right? Let's go all out. If it's, if it's 57 feet or 13,500, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. So I uh, decided to just sit in the back and let all these other people jump. And as they were jumping, you know, and, and, and falling and skydiving, the pilot wasn't reporting as we climbed up higher that anyone had died. So I'm, I'm like, these people have managed to survive. So maybe I will too. And all the apprehension and terror, which you will feel when you do it, I expect, builds up, builds up, builds up. You're sitting in the doorway, and then all of a sudden it's go time. A light turns green, and you're out the door. And the second you're out the door, that's the least scary part of it, which is amazingly counterintuitive. You'd think that you'd be screaming like a wild baby all the way down. And instead, you go out the door, and as you start to free fall at 100 miles an hour, 120 miles or whatever it is, and you're like a meteor zooming through space, the first thought that went through my mind is, oh my gosh, here I am. Because there's no alternative. It's not like, ah, I changed my mind. I'm going to go to the store and buy you know some apples. No, you're literally falling out of a plane. And you do it with the like, instructor tied to your back, right? Exactly. It's tied to your back, and you're falling through space and time at 100 miles an hour. And the ground is beneath you and it's completely overwhelming. And it's unlike any intense thing that might happen day to day, meaning 
it, you know, our conversation might be heightened and intense and awesome, but, but we're not going to be, uh, I like the Imperial March ringtone. Um, cause it felt that ominous before I jumped out of the plane. <laughs> but when I, when I finally did jump out, the fear goes away. Cause then you're just falling and you just put your faith in whatever you put your faith in. And then there you go. You're falling through space and time. And the free fall is about a minute. It goes by very quickly. And then they pull the, the rip cord and you're floating, floating, floating. You make it down to the, uh, the earth and you've survived and here you are to live to tell the tale, but I would highly recommend, highly recommend, um, jumping out of an airplane. If it's on your bucket list, I would highly recommend it. My fear would be, I think we like, I'm sure it doesn't happen. Like, you know, you're in the, in the, in the doorway, and they push you out. I'm afraid like, I would like try to fight back. Right. Like, no, I'm not going right. So what they said was that only one or two people that they remembered landed with the plane, meaning instead I'm not getting out of the plane, I'm not doing this. Uh, they said that it, it's very, 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 very rare. And it's I think, okay. yeah. And if you say you don't want to go there, or they say, okay, come back. Well, yeah. I mean, if you say I'm not going, I'm not going. As far as they're concerned, they got your whatever it is, 300 bucks to, you yeah, know, to go up. So yeah. they're fine. They don't want to force you into a heart attack. But I'm sure a lot of people are like, I don't know. I don't know. And they kind of coax you along because they know that 999 million times out of a whatever that you're not going to be dead. Or they probably do like, like, suppose I was going, going first. I said, I don't want to go. I'll go back. And then some like 15 year old girl, or, like, you know, 95 year old lady went right. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. And the people, ego goes, kicks in. Well, that's right. People of all ages go. And the people before you are from all walks of life too. And they jump out of the plane and you think to yourself, it's impossible that every single person that's jumped out of this plane before me, if everyone before today survived, right? There's nothing right. in the news that says everyone no. dies. So if, it's impossible to think that the 12 people before me that I just watched go out that door fell to their deaths. That statistic, statistically doesn't make yeah. sense. So if it's true that they survived, the chances of me dying is probably pretty slim. So and how about go. this? This is my other fear too, like the landing, right? I have my mind like you land I, and I land too fast. I break my legs, you know, or something yeah. like that. How's that landing work? Okay. The landing, they, 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 they tell you to lift your feet up as you're, as you're kind of gliding in towards the end and just basically start walking. Okay. Now, keep in mind, you have strapped to your back an expert who's done 10,000 jumps, yeah. you know, so they're used to moving the parachute in a way that the lift helps the landing. I mean, the first person who were flying in a plane were probably thinking, this is fun floating around up here with the seagulls, but the landing is not going to be very pleasurable. Yeah. And then they figured out how to ease it in so yeah. that it, it worked. Well, skydiving is very similar in that the, the landing is actually the ease into the ground. It's not like you fall... 13,480 feet and the last 20 feet, they cut you loose in the parachute and say, see you later. And you know, good luck as you fall the last 20 or 30 feet. No, you, it's, it's very, it's very easy. So yeah. I know, um, that, that it's called the Sonomish, um, Snohomish. Yeah. Snohomish. I yeah. know my, uh, Barbara does go those a lot too. I do. I have a bar down to come. He said he's been like three or four times. So just make right. a really popular one. It's a really popular one. They're really well readed. Rated. Uh, I don't know how expensive or inexpensive they are compared to others. I picked them just because I saw their name and I'm like, you know what? Jumping out of a plane over here is the same as jumping out of a plane over there. If they've got good Yelp ratings, it means people survive to review them. So I'm like, oh, good, let's do it. And I'm guessing you filmed it. They filmed it all for you. They film it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's an extra 50 bucks or something. Okay. But I mean, you're not going to go skydiving and then no. think to yourself, I'm going to save money now. No. No, yeah, no, I've got the whole thing, the free fall. I've got yeah. the, the landing, the whole deal. Yeah, I've got it all on video. So nice. it's pretty fun. Well, was that a one and done thing for you? Or? Yeah, one and done. I mean, because okay. the thing is, I scuba dive. So that's another thing I do. Okay. Yeah, I scuba dive. So scuba diving, once you overcome the hurdle, of the expense of buying your gear. If you choose to buy gear, uh, you're, you're in great shape. Scuba diving is very, very expensive to get into. If you choose to buy gear, if you choose to rent and you go all the time, it's also very expensive, but if you choose to buy gear, it's expensive. But once you buy the gear, you're good for years, for years. So my point is rather than jump out of an airplane again, I'd rather put that money into renting tanks and weights or whatever extra accoutrements I needed to, uh, to go scuba diving another couple of times. And, and you scuba dive here off the coast of Washington? I can't imagine there's like good scuba diving places here already. Okay, well, here's the thing, is that if you want to see a giant Pacific, Pacific octopus, you're not going to see it in a lot of places in the country. You're going to see it here. In order to see the giant Pacific octopus or an octopus, you need to be scuba diving in, in water that's really cold, which is here. And that's true year round. Summertime is not warm here. Summertime is cold. Wintertime is very cold. Um, 
visibility here on a good day. People are talking about seeing 20 feet. When I was scuba diving in St. Martin in the Dutch Antilles, uh, you're scuba diving and visibility is 100 feet, 120 feet. It's like you see forever. Here, there's some days where you're scuba diving and you and I sitting five feet apart wouldn't be able to see each other. And that's not the best. So the conditions here are not great. It's what we have. It's great training in a way because when, then when you go to someplace tropical, if you're scuba diving in, the, in, in, in some Bahamas equivalent, all of a sudden your life is great because the water is so warm. I mean, I was in Thailand scuba diving this last January for about oh, man, 10 I days. Man, I bet it was great. It, 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 it was great. Nice the water is there. Well, I mean, it was nice. The, the conditions when I were there, when I was there were not ideal just because of tides and whatnot. But even then, the, sh the, 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 the sea life, the fish are absolutely amazing. But what was funny is the, the Thai guides, the Thai dive instructors didn't want to get in the water. Um, they were reluctant to get in the water because the water was only like 70, 72 degrees, 73 yeah, degrees. Yeah, it was too cold for more. Yeah, and I'm like, guys, you have no idea. Come to Seattle sometime where the water's 50 degrees and see how you do, you know? So it was, it, was, it was nice to have this training in scuba diving here in the Northwest to allow for better experiences elsewhere. So. Now, I'm guessing, you, do you have to be like a really strong swimmer to be a scuba diver? Um, I guess you can't be a weak swimmer, right? I mean, you can't be a weak swimmer. It helps to be, it helps to have some swimming skills and be comfortable in the water. Yeah, it does. I mean, you don't have to be a, an Olympic gold medal swimmer. You don't have to be able to swim for half a mile, you know, without taking a breath, that kind of thing. But having a, a level of comfort in the water goes a long way. Because the thing about scuba diving is what you're continually trying to do is uh, be safe and have a safe dive. And whether that dive is aborted after five minutes because something goes wrong and you're staying safe, or whether that dive goes 40 minutes because everything goes right and you're staying safe. You want to stay safe in the water and make sure that your buddy, your dive buddy, is staying safe with you. That said, having strong water skills, underwater skills, swimming skills, breathing skills, and that sort of thing is helpful because let's say you and I are scuba diving. If something goes wrong, I want to have rescue diver instincts kick in and be able to save you rather than think to myself, oh, I've only swum twice in my life. You know, tough luck, Jason. Yeah, I guess too, on. something that does go wrong, you need to be able to keep your like cool under pressure, right? You don't need to be freaking out and, you know, frantically like, it's oh my God. Essential. I'm, because, be because if you and I are scuba diving uh, and something goes wrong, say, with your breathing apparatus, with your regulator, something goes wrong with your wetsuit and there's a leak, chances are good you're going to freak out. And you might not, right? You might, you might, you might not freak out. You might be able to, to, to keep it under control, but chances are good there is the potential that you're going to that you're going to freak out underwater, and uh, if you do, then it's up to your buddy to keep you calm and get you back to shore safely. So, yeah, it's it's a process for sure of, of constantly remaining calm and breathing and being chill, even though you're in a very unusual environment, a very awkward and unusual environment. So scuba diving is very unusual for sure. So, what's the longest you've been underwater, or what's the deepest you've gone? Well, when you're a recreational scuba diver, you are not rated to go extraordinarily deep. Like you're not doing some 500, you know, 500 feet down, you know, 20,000 leagues under the sea, swim with the, you know, the great squid type of deal. You're, you're only diving typically 40, 50, 60, 70 feet, 80 feet, somewhere in there is pretty typical, you know, up to a hundred feet. I can't remember the exact numbers on recreational, but you know, you're going to be in a very unusual situation if you're diving over a hundred feet. I mean, certainly, I mean, those are pretty unusual conditions. So I, I've been down that deep before. Um, and the longest you've been underwater, there's a, a, a correlative between when you're scuba diving, between how shallow you are and how long your air lasts, the deeper you go, you're going to use air faster. So when you are uh, underwater and you're shallow 10, 15 feet and you're underwater for 50 minutes or an hour, that's pretty common, but the same tank might only last you 20 minutes or 15 minutes if you're at 90 feet, 100 feet, and there's charts, of course, and things that we're supposed to memorize, which I probably should, uh, that let you know, of course, exactly at what depth, how long you have, but you all have diving computers, and diving computers tell you that too, so. Has been a time like you're diving, and you, and you like turn around, there's something like, like maybe a big-ass octopus or shark, like, <laughs> like, oh, shit, like, where did this come from, right? <laughs> well, I, 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 I haven't had an octopus or a shark, but I did have a time when I was underwater in my light. Um, I was at about 100 feet with a friend. We were swimming in a, uh, an old, um, uh, it was a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, not, a, not, a, not a mine. It was a, um, a spring, a natural spring down in Florida that went straight down basically, and then had a slight curve to it. And we we're down around hundred feet and there's no light down there. So you've got a light that you're carrying. 
And that light that we were carrying, or the light that I was carrying went out, my light went out. So uh, had it not been for having a backup light and my friend having a light, I would have been in pitch darkness. So there was a split second where I was like, oh my gosh, now what? But again, that's the calm moment, right? Signal to your buddy, my light went out. Okay, no problem. Let's slowly start to ascend. And then you've got this, you know? You, you take you pick up problems and you you run with them and you make them not problems basically do people ever lose like a sense of direction they do they forget like th that up there is the air down here is water a absolutely okay. and especially in a panic situation and you know we learned that in rescue diving the people um if you get certified as a rescue diver you start to learn that people lose their sense of orientation certainly where land is right because sure my dive computer is telling me and my compass is telling me what direction is what I know that the space needles there, that means that's generally north or whatever compared to where I am now. Well, try to think that rationally if something's going wrong with your breathing apparatus underwater. Try to think that rationally if all of a sudden, you know, like you said, a giant octopus startles you or a shark or something, all of a sudden you're like, wait, whoa, 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 you're freaking out. You don't know where you are. Uh, there's a lot of disorientation that can happen, especially in low visibility, right? So we have to be able to in situations where we're in low vis, be constantly be thinking, okay, what direction am I? What's the way back to shore? How deep am I? You're constantly checking those things. So that, and I keep using you as an example, like you're the one who's gonna have the nightmare underwater, but let's say Jason freaks out, it's okay. We are 10 feet away from shore. You don't realize that we are four feet of underwater. You know what I'm saying? And you can keep people calm that way as you ascend. Even if you're 40 feet underwater and 100 feet from shore, as long as you've got that navigation and orientation, you're in good shape. You have like a bucket list destination to do a scuba dive at? I have two books at home. One is called 50 Dives to Do Before You Die, and the other is called 111 Dives to Do Before You Die or something like that. So yeah, every, every single place in those books, basically. I have a good friend in Southern California, and he and I um, uh, are always talking about cool dive spots. I'd love to dive the Maldives. I would love to dive uh, some of the periphery of Australia. is supposed to be absolutely brilliant. Um, Galapagos Island is supposed to be fantastic. There's places throughout Indonesia, which are very, very hard and very expensive and time consuming to get to, uh, which I, I'd love to dive as well. Uh, yeah, in the next couple of years, I'll do some cool dive spots. My friends and I have talked about, my friend and I have talked about doing Iceland as well, which sounds like very warm. Um, but yeah, we'll see, you know. So back in the day, maybe still now, you did a lot of movies, either directing or involved with movies. Yeah, producing, yeah, producing, producing yeah. Can you talk about those like that independent movies that got released? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was it was never studio pieces when I was um, producing documentaries, and I still have my hand in 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 some projects that are in in process. But when I was actively doing that that kind of work, uh, I was working on a couple different things. One was a documentary called Flight from Death, which is a documentary about fear of death on a subconscious level and how that impacts our our behavior. So uh, the, the documentary Flight from Death did quite well at film festivals. It won Best Documentary at a number of festivals around the world, actually, and saw DVD at the time, DVD release in Australia, DVD release in the United States. And that was uh, made by a company called Transcendental Media from California, uh, directed by a guy named Patrick Shen. And he and I wrote it and, and produced it, and he directed. And it was a pretty awesome experience. And there were other documentaries that we did well as well at the time. And it was... It was fun to tell stories in a different way. I'm often telling stories with my voice vocally in front of audiences in situations like this. But I, uh, I found that, that telling a, a story through video was challenging in a new way and, and, and actually a lot of fun. You're putting together so many different components to tell the story. It's not just, here's Greg, here's my words, let's go, but rather how are we portraying this in the same way that inflection adds meaning. How are we shooting this in the same way that pausing can add intensity, right? To People don't sentence. realize how powerful pause can be, right? It's amazingly powerful. If, if I suddenly stop talking and we weren't talking about pauses and that pause went on for a minute, it would be unbearable. Like people, know, wouldn't, right? people wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah. They think something went wrong with the microphone. Something went wrong with Greg. Something went wrong with Jason. Some of the power's out in Seattle. Your mind goes a million different directions. Yeah. And you actually graduated, I think, from the Cornish School of Fine Arts. Well, Cornish College of the That's Arts. That's here in Seattle, correct? Mm -hmm. And that was a background, that laid the, the educational framework for you to do all the movie stuff? Well, actually, yeah, in a, in a sense. But, you know, my, my experience at Cornish, I was at Cornish during a, a golden era of Cornish. And, and I say that because Cornish has gone through many incarnations where it's been stronger uh, academically or stronger institutionally. 
And uh, I was at Cornish during a time when it was uh, in a golden era of, of teaching. The teachers were very underpaid. And as a result of being very underpaid, some of them took the attitude of, uh, forget this, I'm not really devoting myself to this school or this process. Others thought, I'm not being very well paid, but I'm also not being very well administrated. So I'm just going to do whatever I want. And I was very fortunate to be with some renegade uh, anarchistic teachers who who, who took, took it unto themselves to make sure that education was was the most important thing they could engage in with us. And one teacher in particular, a guy named John Wilson, who's uh, the, your favorite genius you've never heard of, um, really taught us well, not about making documentaries and things like that, even though I was studying acting and theater, but John taught us about the the transformation from ritual to theater and the role that each plays in society. And that sounds esoteric and very artistic, but if if you look at ritual, it was an experience where people were doing things which they thought were connected to natural processes, maybe. You and I do this podcast, and in our minds, that's what makes the sun rise tomorrow. Okay, well, accurate or not, what the, the, what the theater experience was, was all of a sudden we were doing this not just because we thought it made the sun rise tomorrow, but somebody was watching, and all of a sudden this became performative. And that's a fascinating transition, where we go from something that we think is connected directly to a natural process to something that we're performing to communicate something about that experience, a natural process, to somebody who's watching. All of a sudden, it's a different communicative world, essentially. We're not just doing this because we think the sun's going to rise. We're doing this because we want to communicate something to a viewer. So that transformation was very interesting for somebody who's been on stages throughout his life, because I started thinking to myself, what am I communicating and why? And in, in, in each moment, what is this thing that I'm doing? I started to theorize and think constantly about performance and communication and theater and, and what, it, what, it, what it means and what it does for us. So that's what John Wilson taught me. And are you involved in any movies now or any plans to do any more movies in the future? Yeah, you know, we've talked about it. There's a, a documentary that's being batted around from a couple different sources about the Teen Dance Ordinance which is a Seattle law that existed on the books. I don't know if you're familiar with this whole I'm not. saga. Uh, this is, a, I mean, this could be the next three hours of our lives, but I'll, I'll, and succinctly said, back in the, uh, in the 80s and into the 90s, there was a law on the books in, in the city of Seattle called the Teen Dance Ordinance. And it essentially was a law that was rooted in morality. And I say that with that affect because I want to put it in air quotes. The idea was that if the city prevented people of all ages from attending music events, dances, concerts, what have you, if they prevented them from attending those events together, that they would prevent immorality from happening in the city. It would prevent, you know, people from getting drunk or stoned at events. It would, it would protect the youth. Protecting the youth is always so, so like a footloose movie sort of thing, like a footloose movie come to life in the city of Seattle. So there's a, a number of people who have documented this over the years, both in print and in interviews and whatnot. But uh, there's a, a, a podcast called Let the Kids Dance, which came out this year, which is quite brilliant. And definitely it's a short form, uh, seven part podcast that people should listen to to get the full story and the history of the teen dance ordinance. But basically, my, my friends and I did our very best to overturn this law and in fact, ended up not only overturning it, but my friend Dave and I co-wrote the law that replaced the teen dance ordinance in the city of Seattle. So the law that allows for music to happen is something that my friend Dave and I wrote, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal guy, I, I'm just a guy. And we <laughs> wrote this law and submitted it to the city through the appropriate channels and it ended up getting passed. And it's a whole process. You'd have to listen to the podcast to get it, but there's talk of doing a documentary about the teen dance ordinance and the struggle and the, the, the fight against and for the all ages dance ordinance that replaced the teen dance ordinance. Nice. So next, let's switch to your nonprofit. It's called a 100 for Haiti, right? Yeah. Does that name mean anything? Is there any significance in the name or is this a name? No, that's a great question. When, when 100 for Haiti formed, I, I went to Haiti right after the earthquake in 2010, which was one of the greatest natural disasters, certainly in our hemisphere and in world history. It was, it was cataclysmic. And I sailed there on a sailboat with some friends to provide medical supplies and food there. And when I got there, I realized that there was more work that needed to be done. And there was a doctor that I met who was giving away medicine and medical care for free in his neighborhood in Port-au-Prince, a very uh, poor neighborhood in Port-au-Prince. And I decided to try to help him. And what I thought was if I could get 100 people to donate $1,000 or more to Haitian relief, I'd give all that money to this guy. I'd have $100,000 to give to him. These 100 people would be the 100 for Haiti. 
And then it would be quite remarkable that we'd raised all this money and given it to this guy. Well, the people who started responding to requests for uh, donations weren't wealthy people who had $1,000. They were people who had $100 or $10, $5, $2, $1. I kept the name 100 for Haiti because I just liked it. One thing that I want to do is rebrand it, to be honest. I want to rebrand it around the 100. So maybe it'll be 100 days of giving for Haiti or 100 Haitians you've never heard of, a history lesson, 100 of this, 100 of that. I've wanted to rebrand it for a while but I've been so busy working on other projects. I haven't been able to do that sort of behind the scenes rebranding, but I just like the uh, alliterative, if that's the right word, yeah. 100 for Haiti. I, there's a lot of H's in there. Kind of an interesting sounding name and people ask about it. So. Yeah. So can be wrong, but if I remember correctly from my history and back in college, Haiti was colonized by the French. The French had a bunch of Haitian slaves and the Haitian general D. Baptiste, I think, was the only person who actually like rebelled against a yeah. active colonizer. Yeah, well, basic, I mean, basically in, in short form, the, the Haitians decided they'd had enough and they overthrew their slave masters, basically. So the, the history of Haiti is quite extensive, but Haiti is the only country where that's ever, yeah. ever worked, as far as and I know. And the friends like, there's, what's going on? There's no way. How are these people beating us? This is impossible. Oh, it, like wasn't just the, it wasn't just the French. It wasn't just, it wasn't just the, the whole, colonizers whole there. World. It's the United States. I mean, read the, read the, uh, the uh, congressional record from the, the mid-1800s, and the congressmen are, are aghast with how these former slaves in Haiti have managed to overthrow their oppressors. Why were they aghast? Because they were slave owners. They were terrified. They were terrified that if if the Haitians did this just off our border, what happens if slaves on plantations in the American South got wind of this? You know, and all of a sudden, you know, you know, you know, as the joke goes, peace is bad for business. Meaning, what happens if if all of a sudden they the, the slaves in the United States wanted a different deal, and instead of the warfare mindset that slavery presented, what if they wanted to be? in control of their own lives and bring peace to their own lives. It would be like, bad for that. It's not, like, it's not like Haitians like 20,000 miles away. It's like right on a, like, like a short boat road, right? It's literally right off the coast of Florida, yeah. basically. It's just a couple hours away. So, you know, the, the, the slave owners, these politicians were thinking to themselves, this is potentially bad for business and we don't want this. And so they did their best to suppress Haiti, which is one of the reasons why economically and politically the country's been suppressed forever for hundreds of years it's basically in retribution for uh, haitians overthrowing their slave masters yeah and i could be wrong but i think if you picked like the list of top 10 countries with the worst luck haiti has been there right yeah because i remember like when i was in military 94 there was some kind of military dictatorship and they were sending a, a division there yep that, but they but they brought them back i mean it's like every year they, i mean i make this up exactly it's like every year they have an earthquake or some political corruption like bam it's like always like man can haiti catch a we can break. Yeah. And the thing is, it doesn't. And, you know, I've often said that I don't believe in luck because it implies this external force beyond me that, you know, that I, I can't uh, um, submit to essentially. But you know what? Haiti has a lot of bad luck. I mean, you're absolutely right. If there's a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake or a typhoon. And like it goes out, it's going this way. It's it 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 degrees going to Haiti. That's exactly right. And the earthquake hitting in Haiti. And then, the, you know, it just you name it cholera being introduced to haiti by the uh by united nations um uh humanitarian workers and whatnot everything happens everything that could go wrong happens in haiti that said the haitian people are remarkably resilient and the work that we've been doing with 100 for haiti over the last 14 years has been focused on uh planting crops putting kids in schools building houses helping with clean water systems and you know there, there's a number of things that we do um, all of which are Haitian driven, meaning I'm literally, as I said before, I'm just a guy. I, I work for the Haitians. They don't work for me. It's not like I come in and I say, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Not at all. There's, there's Haitians who say we'd like this. And then it's up to me to go, okay, let's figure out how to fund that and make it happen so that the, the Haiti experience is entirely their own. It's not me dictating anything. So for your nonprofit, like what determines from your point of view that the nonprofit is being successful or that's being a failure? Like, how do you determine that? No, that's a great question. And basically for me, what determines if it's a failure or if it's a success in terms of 100 for Haiti is uh, when I ask the Haitians, are you doing okay? And they say, yeah, we're happy with how things are going. We're happy with the houses that have been built. We're happy with the kids that have gone to school. We're happy with the water systems. We're happy with the fact that you feed hungry families and we're happy with the crops you've helped to, to plant. Um, we'll get back to you in a month or two and we're not going to be happy anymore. And then we're going to do other work. We're going to need more, need more houses, need more of this, need more of that. But for the moment, yeah, we're happy. Then great success. 
So if, if 100 for Haiti is able to build houses, able to send kids to school, that's baseline. That's, that's baseline success as I'm, as I'm concerned. But then again, it's not up to me. It's up to the Haitians that we work for. If they say they're happy, then I'm happy too. So my knowledge of Haitian government is very, very limited, right? But it seems like on TV, they're like always corrupt, not the best leaders. How do you like uh, uh, navigate that as far as you're nonprofit? Doing, you have to do anything with the Haitian government? They, they, yep. You have to like pay them bribes or something? Or like how you like navigate that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> that's not even a ridiculous question. That's a that's an absolutely level-headed question. The Haitian government, or lack thereof, is a mess. And what we need to do is uh, is is twofold, basically. One is we have done all of the things that we need to do in Haiti in order to become a registered um, uh, nonprofit. Is it's not quite the Haitian term for it in Haiti, meaning we're registered in Haiti as as an organization that does this kind of work. That's a jumping through of hoops that everyone has to do. I mean, it's kind of like the equivalent of paying taxes, registering your business, and what have you. It's just made all all the more difficult because all the documents are in French and you're often dealing with people who speak Creole and you're trying to figure out, am I doing this correctly? Am I filling this out correctly? Or, or have we done this right? And of course, everyone has an opinion. Everyone's willing to, you know, work and answer your questions, but you got to make sure that are these people, you know, in it for themselves or they actually work for who they say they work for. <laughs> so navigating that was, was, was a, a, a basket full of joy. But once we figured that out and did that, uh, and establish a bank account in Haiti, and and did all the things that you you know you do in order to run it correctly. Well, then it's a function of just doing good work, right? And and we don't work in conjunction with the Haitian government. We're not working on these major, major structural developments. That's not the size of our organization. We don't go into Haiti and say, "Hey, Haitian government, we have twenty five million dollars to spend on building a stretch of road between Carrefour and and Port-au-Prince." It's not even that's not even in the realm of possibility. We're talking about building a one room house for a family out of sticks and mud and tin for the roof five hours away from Port-au-Prince. The government by and large doesn't care about the work we do because they're focused on keeping things together in Port-au-Prince. And when I say keeping these together, they're very <laughs> loosely together. Yeah, they're very loosely together in Port-au-Prince. So, so the work that we do is, is, is of benefit to Haitian politicians locally because if people are happy, they're gonna vote for you. And it's of benefit I would suggest nationally to have nonprofits be doing consistent work because it makes people happy. It improves the quality of life for, for folks. But, but we don't, you know, it's not like I fly into Port-au-Prince and I meet with the, the president or the secretary of the interior or what have you. I've, I've gone to meetings like that, and by and large, they're as you would expect. The meetings are, um, at, are tedious and at times not exactly what I've wanted, so we, we stay up in the north. So worst case scenario, I suppose you go there, and yeah, it's like creation gangsters like kidnap half of y'all and they want $10 million in ransom. Do you guess, can you expect support from the U.S. government, the Haitian government, or are you like on your own if something bad like that happens? Uh, if uh, I make sure that, something, that nothing bad like that happens. Yeah. And one of the ways I make sure that nothing bad like that happens is I sit here in Seattle talking to you instead of going to Port-au-Prince. Uh, I would highly recommend people not go to Port-au-Prince right now. Uh, that said, there are people who go, there are people who go in groups, there are people who go with, with you know, with escorts, guards, and whatnot, I would highly recommend against going to Haiti right now. I don't. So I haven't been in a few years. And that's a, a, a function of safety because if you get kidnapped by a gang, to answer your question, sure, the U.S. government might care. Haitian government's not going not to do anything, I don't think. Because if, if the gangs are kidnapping you, that's beyond the pale of Haitian society. So the Haitians are going to say, this is a crime, sure, but they don't have the 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 human power to enforce that. You'd hope that the U.S. government would intervene. Who knows if they would before you were unfortunately killed. You'd hope that your family has enough money to pay for the uh, the kidnapping. The best thing to do is not go to Haiti right now. Okay. Let's suppose, let's fast forward like four years in the future. Everything's Haiti's like peachy keen, you kind of rainbows. You want to go to like a nonprofit mission and someone wants to go with you. Yep. How would that work? Great, great question. So the idea of Haiti being peachy keen in four years is uh, ambitious. Fantasy, <laughs> fantasy, right? <laughs> it's ambitious. So, but that said, four years from now, let's say they've figured out the gang issue in Port-au-Prince. And by that, I mean establish some sort of uh, governmental organization, which is keeping the peace in addition to keeping order. Because the gangs keep order. Let's, let's be realistic. The gangs keep order. People love order. People love that. They love the fact that they feel safe and protected 
because they're not at the at the at the wrong end of a gun. They feel uh, happy with the fact that the gangs are making sure that food comes through. Uh, but there's a trade off for that, right? And far be it from me to dictate what's right or wrong for the Haitian people. But you know, there's 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 many people who want the gangs to stay in place in Haiti because they're happy with the situation as it is. It makes it trickier to do the work that we do. But again, it's not about me. It's about the Haitians we work for. And the gang situation up north is not the same as it is in Port-au-Prince. That said, to answer your question, it's four years from now. Everything's unicorn and rainbows. I go to Haiti. Someone wants to come with me. What I typically say, unless they speak Creole, unless they have experience in Haiti, is take the money that you would have spent on a plane ticket and expenses and donate it to some Haitian initiative. It doesn't even have to be ours, to some Haitian initiative. And the reason I say that is because let's say I go to Haiti to build houses and I bring my friend Paul, who's a carpenter. I just took away a job opportunity from Haitian people by doing that. So I typically will go there in order to meet people and connect and see firsthand, oh, wow, these really got built. Oh, wow, you really do need this help over here with this. We're happy to help, of course, that sort of thing. But I'm not really bringing teams of people in. A, the funds aren't there. But B, uh, I think that you run the risk of taking opportunities away from, from Haitian people. Now, is a Haitian and a Haitian, are they broken out of different tribes, different ethnicities, different, you know, like, there's, I mean, there's like that? Different folks of different backgrounds, certainly. And I'm not, I'm not well-versed enough to speak to it. But there's definitely people who have, who have come from different parts of, of Haiti, different parts of uh, the world and ended up there, certainly. And, and speak different, you know, not necessarily dialects, but just different slang in a way. Like there definitely is like slang in Creole. So I don't speak Creole myself and I only pick up what I pick up from friends who are down there. But depending on whether or not you're in the city, if you're in Port-au-Prince or if you're way out in the periphery, you're going to have a different experience. Especially true also if you had a formal education and you grew up speaking French and then all of a sudden you're out in the fo- with the country folk, you know, hours away from Port-au-Prince, they're not speaking French. And in fact, when I come in with my rudimentary French, I sound like a white guy trying to communicate in Haiti. I don't sound like I'm this cool, hip dude who's speaking the local language, not even close. I'm just, I sound like a guy who's speaking, you know, the, the language of the government, the language of the elite in a way. And it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I need, to, I need to brush up on my Creole, and I'm always trying to do that when I go. And what's the economy they're based on? And, and do they, what is the economy based on? Do they actually export anything out the country? You know, at this point, I'm not sure. But over time, there have been times where people are exporting coffee. That's been very popular. I've always wanted there to be more mangoes exported from Haiti because there's mangoes, like, by the gajillions. Uh, I think that uh, lumber for a while was a thing until all the trees got cut down. And then uh, beyond that, I can't recall, like, in the last year, ever looking up what exports are currently. But, you know, you've also got a situation where, you know, a lot of the ports are being controlled and a lot of the ports don't have the access that they typically would because of the gang activity there. So I don't know what what the strength of their exports are now. I mean, that would take a Google searching on my part, just as it would anybody else's at this point. But All right. Yeah. And so you might not know the answer to this, but I might be making this up. So I know the Dominican, Dominican Republic, DR, and Haiti are the same honor, right? Mm-hmm. And it seems like, you know, always hear people going on vacation, Dominican Republic, having a good time, going to the beaches. Like, how did this happen, right? I'm sure there's like a complicated story, but like, how's that one half the island like kind of like seems like the prosperous? No, other half is like, yeah. what the hell's going on? That's a good question. And I used to know the answer to that. But in, what I'll say to speak to it rather than giving you the history is that it's very true that, that the DR, Dominican Republic, is, is very well uh, populated, supplied with things, right? It, they're doing all right. And, and as soon as you cross the border into Haiti, that it's very different. And I think that uh, o- over time, there's been people crossing the border and, you know, you see kind of a blending of the worlds in a way, but I don't know if the border is as accessible as it used to be. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but there are even areas of Haiti where cruise ships go and these cruise ships go to beaches that are pristine in Haiti that are fenced off from the rest of the population. Basically, Haitians work there at these beach resorts. And your cruise ship comes up and parks, you get off a beach, it's pristine and perfect. Like, my God, Haiti is beautiful. Now, Haiti is beautiful in many, many, many parts of the country, but it's not pristine cruise ship beautiful. This is area that is owned by the cruise ships, that's that's maintained by the cruise ships to create a certain illusion of sorts. So there's a, a lot of maneuvering that goes on in terms of how Haiti is positioned in the world. So 
So Greg, before we move on, is anything you else you want to talk about for your nonprofit? Any events coming up or anything else you want to just talk about for your nonprofit? Yeah, well, I would say that if people are interested uh, to go to 100forhaiti.org, O-N-E-H-U-R, uh, H-U-R, 100, H-U-N-D-R-E-D, 100, F-O-R-H-A-I-T-I, 100 for Haiti, all spelled out, dot org. Uh, we're going to be updating the website soon. I've been working on a number of projects over the last year and year and a half. And while the website hasn't been updated, the work has always continued. We've been working consistently in Haiti for the last couple of years. And I would suggest people go to the website if they want to find out more or if they want to find out more. Another thing you can do is just learn more of the history of this country. It's fascinating. And, you know, we hear in the news recently negative things about Haitians, which is most unfortunate because the, 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 the Haitian people have a lot to offer and a lot of history. So I would suggest start by Googling Haitian history. You'll be fascinated to learn about the debt that was was placed over the heads of Haitians in response to them basically free, um, freeing themselves from slavery. They were made to pay reparations. They were made to pay reparations for lost, basically, income on the part of the, the, the slave owners. It's mind-boggling. Look at the financial history of Haiti, the history of it. Go to the 100 for Haiti website and uh, be in touch anytime if people have questions or ideas. So, Greg, you also um, a chapter board member for something called the National Speakers Association. Yeah, Talk about that. yeah, for sure. So the National Speakers Association is a speaking organization here in the Pacific Northwest. The National Speakers Association, like national version, is a... Uh, it's a national organization, as, as the name suggests, but it's broken down into chapters around the United States. So the chapter in the Northwest covers all of the Northwest. I think technically we're Montana, Idaho, Washington, I don't think Oregon, but I think Alaska is under our purview, if that's the right word, or under our control and domination. Uh, no, it's under our uh, you know, auspices, I guess you'd say. And I'm on the board of the National Speakers Association Northwest. And basically the idea behind the NSA is to build a better speaking business, get out in front of more people and, and communicate better. So I enjoy speaking and connecting with folks. And being on the board is a way of giving back. I think it's important if you're a member of an organization to do your best to give back to that organization too. So I, my, my job is, is, is a, as member, new, you know, member acquisition, member growth. So in all, in all actuality, I should say to you, Jason, you're a, you should be a member. Uh, but I, that's what I'm always trying to do is, is, Think of ways to find new members who are interested in connecting with and hearing from other speakers, trainers, consultants, people related to the communicative arts about how they might network and grow their own businesses and become better speakers themselves. So, Greg, what does it mean to be a professional speaker? It's a great question. Well, it means that you're in front of audiences. It means you're getting paid for speaking and presenting. It means that you have something to say that is of value to other people and that people are essentially willing to exchange money for your time. I mean, that's what it takes to be a professional, right? Our, our greatest commodity is time. That's what we have for sale. And the jobs that we participate in are not just activities. They're, they're, tra they're trading opportunities. We're trading our most valuable commodity that cannot be replaced, time, in exchange for money. We've decided that our time has a price that's put on it. Uh, you know, today I'm sitting here on your podcast, not because you're paying me because you're not, I'm sitting here because I think you're an interesting human and conversation's cool. And most people say, let's talk for 40 minutes. You're like, let's talk for 40 hours. I'm like, okay, I got to figure out what this guy's all about. Let's do this. Well, my time that is very limited as yours is, as everybody's is, is worth it to me to sit here and have a conversation with you. In fact, so worth it that I don't need to get paid, but a professional, somebody who's doing this full time in front of an audience for a client, make sure that they get paid. So that's really the differentiator between an amateur and a professional. And I'm not saying I'm an amateur because I'm sitting here. We do some things for fun. That's something I do for fun is podcasts and interviews and whatnot. But I think it's, it's important to remember that a professional is somebody who's getting paid to speak to audiences with an idea. For example, I did a keynote this morning for a medical group here in Seattle. And I spoke to them about distraction, isolation, and uh, I made sure that we were talking about these ideas in conjunction with what they do every day. Distraction, isolation, focus, uh, um, uh, pessimism. These were themes that I talked about today, ways to counteract pessimism, isolation, and distraction. So that was a, a you know, paid event, and it's something that I love to do, and it's pretty interesting to have a job where you're communicating ideas on a regular basis. So when you speak in an event, do you only speak on stuff that you know about or do, like a group say, hey, Greg, Speak on some random object, except you have no idea about. I've never had a group say speak on something completely random, but that'd be pretty awesome if they did. If I showed up and they said, you know what, 
We know you've written this book. We know that you have something to say. We're excited that you're here. Please speak on aardvarks, their mating patterns, and the way that global warming might impact the mating patterns of aardvarks. Well, I'd be happy to speak on that, Jason. Uh, no, I have no idea. I don't know what I would say, but okay. I've never been asked to do that yet. Okay. And then let's say like somebody's like the first time professional speaker and they're having trouble getting the first paid speaking gig, right? They're saying, hey, do this for free, whatever the case may be. What's your advice to someone like, like, that, like stand their ground and like get paid what you think your value is? Well, this is an awesome question, okay? So, so oftentimes when people are new to speaking, they're not sure A, where to find clients and B, how to pursue them. Well, the fact of the matter is there's events constantly in every city in the country and they all need speakers. So it's possible to find speaking opportunities if you're willing to match the budgets of many organizations who don't have a budget, say, for speaking. But the more important thing is, do you have a message to share? Not do you have, it goes back to what we were talking about before when we were talking about coins, about aesthetics versus value, in that you know we pride ourselves on, on a value trade here in the United States where I trade my time for money. Well, how much money? How much is my time worth? If I was gonna die in five minutes, this would be a really expensive interview for you, right? But hopefully I'm not going to. So my thought is, you know what? The benefit for me is that I get to have a conversation with a new friend. We get to impact people who listen to us. That's of interest to me. Even if I don't get financially uh, paid for being here with you today. Well, people need to ask themselves, what's it worth for me to think up a speech, get up in front of an audience, share that speech with the audience? Maybe it's worth $100. Maybe it's worth $10 million. Who knows? People can establish their own value. And then from there, find organizations or groups that are interested in having them speak. And there's always organizations or groups that are interested. Could be a school group, could be a, a, a religious group, a synagogue, a church, what have you. It could be any one of a number of organizations that, that is in need of a speaker and an idea like yours that you could then get up in front of them and offer something of value to people in exchange for money. And you could figure out with them what that what that budget is. So I'm guessing when you're speaking events, sometimes you go, someone speaks before you, correct? Sometimes, yeah. So do you prefer to speak after someone who like like, like totally bombed it or after someone who like totally killed it, right? Like you have a preference or does it matter? Okay, so I don't have a preference, but let's look at both for a second. Let's say we get up on stage, okay? The next event I do, and it's you speaking before me. And you get up on stage and you destroy the room, like absolutely kill it. Like you, you are the best speaker anyone's ever heard. That's a funny situation for me because I have to then get up on stage and go, all right, okay. I don't know if it's gonna get any better than that. And in fact, it's probably gonna be worse. Hi, I'm Greg Benick. I'm worse than Jason who just killed it. That's funny. And it's a great opening yeah. because then whatever happens, happens. Let's say you get up on stage and you absolutely bomb. Like people are throwing vegetables at you. You get off stage. I walk out on stage and without saying, hey, everybody, Jason just spoke. And man, was he terrible. I could just walk out on stage and say, all right, how's everyone feeling? Let's go. And I'm not going to say, how's everyone feeling? But you know what I mean? Like, Let's go, let's get into this, and people are gonna feel relieved, and the speech is probably gonna go pretty well. Personally, I'd probably rather go after somebody who killed it, because that means that the audience is engaged enough to provide for that killing, right? <laughs> Meaning that the, the what makes an amazingly effective speaker is not their own ability and their own speech, it's the way they connect with the audience and electrify an audience. So if somebody killed, that means they were in relationship with the audience in a way which is uh, powerful and durable and inspiring, and that people felt that and really engaged with the speaker as well. And that doesn't mean that if the speaker's bad, the audience might be great. It probably means the speaker was great and the audience was great and their engagement was great. So, Why do you think so many people would rather die than speak in public? <laughs> Great question. I, I, you know, I, I'm genetically designed to speak. My mom was a speaker and she's retired now, but she was a professional speaker and has been a storyteller her entire life and a speaker. So with that in mind, I'm literally genetically designed to do this. That said, lots of people aren't. And if you said, guess what? I've got great news. You're going to be in front of 4,000 people this morning on a topic that you know pretty well, but you're not exactly sure how well you're going to be received. And you've got 60 minutes to do that. Begin. You're on in 10 minutes. Most of humanity would rather curl up and die or turn into dust. I see that situation. And I go, oh, what an opportunity. Right, yeah, let's go. Let's go. You know, let's do this. But again, my brain's wired differently. I mean, I'm, 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 my brain is wired for this. 
So I feel comfortable in those situations. And even the conversation we're having, right? So for listeners who aren't aware, you and I met however minutes we've been doing this podcast ago. We met two minutes before we started. I have no idea what your question list is. Nothing that I've said has been prepared in advance. It's not like you're asking me questions I get asked every day. Most podcasters are not saying to me, so tell me about the political situation in Haiti and the relationship between gangs and its future survival. It's like, it's not coming up. So- We're just going for it. A lot of people would be terrified in this situation. That doesn't make me better. It just means that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, But I think that people feel intimidated. They don't want to be judged. They don't want uh, people laughing at them. They don't want to feel foolish. And that insecurity is not a detriment. And I'm not slighting those folks. It makes perfect sense why you'd be terrified of those things. But I think that society doesn't reward us very well for speaking up sometimes. And people sometimes are maybe afraid that if they speak up, that uh, they might be criticized. So I think that's where the fear of fear of one, one way, the fear of public speaking manifests in people. Yeah. I think the people don't realize like, suppose you go to an event and like Tom Brown is up there talking about, we'll say social media. You and I may presume that Tom Brown is an expert on social media, right? That's right. Now, sometimes Tom Brown might some, say some stuff three minutes in, like, okay, this guy knows what the fuck you're talking about, you know? <laughs> but that's on you, right? Well, the, but you get the benefit of the doubt, I think. And this is why when you ask me questions about, for example, the history of the Dominican Repo- Republic and Haiti, I could come up with some off the wall or, you know, marginally correct answer for you about that. Or, you know, but I'm not up to up to speed on it. So I'd rather just say, you know what? I think that people shouldn't need to Google that and figure it out for themselves rather than pretend. And yeah, that's true. Hand somebody a microphone and a stage and an audience. Going back to what we talked about earlier about the transformation of ritual to theater. This isn't somebody. Yes, this is the, the Darth Vader. I, thing I, again. Have my, I have my phone like on like don't ring either. That's OK. That's OK. Maybe it's actually Darth Vader calling. You yeah. should answer next time. <laughs> All right. Huh? So the point is, is that, you know, this isn't somebody howling at the moon or or dancing in some ritualistic way. The th- this is theater. I mean, you hand somebody a microphone and say, you're up in front of people. Let's go. People are going to perceive them in a very certain way as a performer, maybe as an expert, maybe as an authority. Uh, there's a famous book on theater by a guy, a guy named Peter Brook. And uh, Peter Brook wrote a book called The Empty Space. And the first line of The Empty Space is, I can take any any space and call it a bare stage. And basically what he goes into talking about is that as long as we have a space to do something that is defined, whether that's an open space or whether that's an enclosed space, a stage, no stage, what have you, as long as we have that space and somebody to watch, he specifies, somebody to watch this experience happen, then a theatrical moment is being created. And in that theatrical moment, the person performing becomes performer, expert, authority, what have you. And this is especially true in our culture. If you hand somebody a microphone, they seem like an authority. Now, for the speaker, that has with it a tremendous amount of responsibility. It means that I can't just sit here and say, well, let me tell you about the history of the Dominican Republic. The the line between the two countries was invented by, uh, you know, Herbert Dominica. It, it, like, I could make something up just because I have a microphone. My responsibility to the listener is to not overextend my authority so and my expertise. Yeah, with me, like, so I'm a, on my Briggs, I'm on FJ, right? Like, only 1% of the world. Like, like one on one, I'm good with this, right? But suppose I, it, I, like eight more people, I clam up, right? I, that's not, I'm not good, right? <laughs> Small talk, like eight, seven people. Yeah, I, I just like, I like shut down, right? I get it. But get now, it. like, suppose we were like a Seattle Chamber of Commerce meeting, right? With 100 people. Yep. And they said, hey, the MC can't come. Can anyone want to say, I'd, like, I'd raise my hand. I'll MC. Of course. I'll of MC, course. Yeah. yeah. Just give me some talking points. That's it. You know? That's it. And you can do it because you're used to being in conversation with people, certainly. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I definitely have people in my life who are like that. People who are uh, skew more towards shy who the idea of small talk in a room is completely overwhelming. Uh, yeah. And I, I go I go kind of two ways with that. There's some times in which I, I go more introverted where I just think to myself, I'd rather be playing Fortnite and just relaxing or doing something completely without engagement. Uh, there's other times where I'm more than happy to dive in and walk up to people and shake hands and say, hey, I'm Greg, what are you all about? What's your story? Yeah. And and that even that causes people to 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 shy away in fear if, if they're not inclined to do that. And I've said to the podcast before, every podcast I have, like you, you, this one started at three o'clock. At two fifty, my mind, hope great don't come. Like, <laughs> like maybe I'll just like go around the corner and like turn my phone <laughs> off, right? And then like 
like so i got us like five minutes and like okay you got to do this jason right every yeah. podcast like 10 minutes out or even, like, every time i got to speak in front of someone 10 50 minutes i get this nauseous feeling like i can't do this then like jason could be no you know quote unquote you know yeah 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 well i'm glad i'm glad that i was the provider for you of, of nausea and hopefully relief <laughs> today uh it's it's funny you know as i was walking up because you and i i i think we suggested today i can't remember if we had more conversations about today the last time we were going to do this there was a lot of traffic there was an event at the stadium. yeah there's like metallica, a, metallica was, playing. was here yeah yep so you went to the one that i think on a friday night and i went to the second one on sunday too okay. so it would have been a, a total conflict the yep. point is is that we rescheduled today but then haven't been in, even in touch since no. then so I, as i'm walking up today i'm thinking you know maybe this guy's gonna be around the corner with his phone off i'm not sure if he's gonna be there yeah. today and it turns out you were here and that's fantastic yeah. and uh, all nausea has been alleviated so there yeah. you have it yeah. So, uh, how does juggling things start? So, so I, and you actually like juggle like chairs, balls, knives. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, stuff. yeah. All kind of things. I, I started juggling when I was a kid, I was placed in a juggling class by mistake. I had signed up for a coin collecting class, which as you know, is something that interested me. And I was signed up for a juggling class by mistake and ended up taking this juggling class. And the second I learned to juggle, the second I even saw juggling, not even learned, the second I learned to juggle or saw juggling even itself, I was transfixed by it because it was a, a metaphor essentially for focus. You can't juggle without focus. And because focus for me had always been challenging. When I saw somebody juggling, a young kid, I thought, my gosh, I want to focus like that, let alone juggle like that. And it became for young nerdy Greg, something that I could learn to do that other people couldn't do. I found that it was fun. People were amazed by it. They were in awe of it. So I just started it. I just started with it. I started practicing all the time and was relentless with practicing and eventually got to a point where I was performing. And then after that point, I mean, I had found my home. So that's how it all started, though. I think I saw somewhere on the internet where, where someone said, you get to pick from two speakers, this guy the, for the PowerPoint, or Greg that's going to juggle some stuff. What do you want? Yeah, exactly. I think the quote was, it might have even been me saying it. It sounds like something I would have said that if the last person was talking about risk taking and I come out on stage and juggle a machete and talk about taking risks, I think that all eyes are going to be on the knife rather than, you see what I mean? Yeah. So I think that, I think that's probably a Greg quote. It sounds like something I would say. And so you've spoken like around 27 countries, right? Yeah, it's been 27 countries now. Yeah. So what have you learned from working with people from these different countries and how has that, you know, affected your like uh, outlook on life? Yeah, you rule. That's a, no a Nobel Prize winning question because I think that, uh, you know, people all the time are uh, interested in and or amazed by the number of countries I've spoken in. But that's not the point. The point is that I've spoken to and with people in all those countries on a mission, for lack of a better word, to try to understand how it, what, what is it that we all have in common? What is it that we don't have in common? Where are the points that we can connect as human beings? It's all been, in a way, a social experiment, as long as it's been a communicative experience. It's been a social experiment to figure out what we have in common. Like, for example, I did a spoken word tour of Ukraine and Russia. I did 21 dates across Ukraine and Russia, the entire, all of, all, all of Russia. And in talking to people, I went in saying, you know, it's really unusual. But when I was growing up, we, all, we thought that you wanted to bomb us, like nuclear bomb us into obliteration. And people were categorically, unanimously, no exceptions, when I would bring that up in Russia, laughing out loud. Like, that is the most ridiculous thing you could ever have said. Where'd you get that idea? I'm like, what are you talking about? The news all the time said the Russians are out to destroy us. And they're like laughing, saying... The news all the time said the Americans were out to destroy us. I'm like, I didn't want to destroy you. And they're like, we didn't want to destroy you. I'm like, my friends didn't want to destroy you. They're like, my friends didn't want to destroy you. And it became this realization that the, the media has played tricks on our minds and that the Russians didn't want to bomb us. Maybe the Russian government was insinuating this and the Ameri American government was insinuating this, but it certainly wasn't a situation where the Russian people were running around fashioning their own nuclear bombs and they couldn't wait to just lob them across the water to our, our shores. Not even close. So what I've learned from being in 27 countries, for example, being in Russia, learned that we actually have a lot more in common than we have different. And that's it sounds trite, but it's true that we actually are very well connected and have a lot that's similar and do not want to bomb each other into oblivion. But the same is true without the bombing side. Let's say if I'm in Rwanda and I'm speaking in Rwanda and talking to folks or showing a documentary there, and having a conversation about their history, people want to heal. 
People want to survive. People want life to be good for their kids. They want their family safe. They want a roof over their head. They want food to be nutritious. They want to live a long and healthy life. And that's true whether they're from Rwanda or whether they're from West Virginia or whether they're from Canada or Mexico or wherever it might be that I've spoken. People want similar things across the board. It's just, that's what I've learned. It's pretty amazing. It brings us all together. So all, all, the, excuse me, all these countries you've been to, what's the country you've been to? Like you actually had a really good time, had a lot of fun. But people are like, what? You had a good time where? Are you sure about this? Like, are you on like drugs or something, Greg? Were you like drunk the whole time? There's no way you had a good time here. Such an awesome question. Uh, it's such an awesome question. I, I would say that uh, Russian people hearing that I spoke in Russia, they're like, really? Because they left Russia for some reason or another, right? Uh, I, that, that's, definitely, that's definitely been true. But I, I've had tremendously good times and have made amazing connections when I've been in Poland and Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and oftentimes people in the West have a bias against the East. And that's true just about everywhere. Like everywhere has a bias within its own geography of some geography and some geographical location in the country. And people in the, in the, uh, in the West of Europe tend to think of people in the East of Europe as uncultured essentially, but they're, they're certainly not. They're fantastic. And my friends in Hungary and the connections I've made in Hungary and the connections I've made in other countries in Eastern Europe have been tremendous. Poland for me is a place that has been absolutely amazing. And over the years, I've made incredible connections and had amazing relationships and had just an amazing time in, in Poland again and again and again and again. So I'm going to single out Poland and Hungary as two places that people aren't saying like, oh my gosh, you were in Beirut in 1982, <laughs> you know, nothing like that. But, you know, I think that, I think that people are surprised when they hear that I've spent time in Haiti. I think that, um, you know, that, that's, that, that's come up before. I mean, I've heard, you know, when I've mentioned Rwanda and people connect it with the genocide or Uganda and they connect it with dictatorships, it's just a lack of knowledge about the countries essentially, which is understandable. I mean, again, we're fed by the media information. What has Rwanda been in the news for in the last 30 years? Well, a genocide, a revitalization based on authoritarian government control and, you know, an, an economy that is a shining light around Africa, but it comes with it a caveat or two. The point is, is that, you know, with, with knowledge of the countries, people learn that, oh, wow, Rwanda is actually pretty interesting and pretty cool. And it's a pretty interesting place. And there's amazing people there. And, and likewise, uh, Poland is the same way. If people in, in, the, in, in Western Europe think less of the East, that's their own misgiving because it's, it's amazing. And I can tell you a funny story about Poland that I showed up on a spoken word tour um, and I was booked in Warsaw to speak. And I didn't realize that I had been booked at a comedy club. I thought I was performing in a, um, a coffee house or I might've been speaking at a, uh, I, didn't remember, I don't remember where the Poland date was booked specifically, but I, I thought that I was just speaking at a venue. And I showed up and I was booked at a comedy club. And I drive up with my, my at a driver who's driving me around Europe. We drive up together, we get up to the front door and there's these big posters. It says Greg Benick from the United States. As if it was like, Bill Burr, or, you know what I'm saying? Like whoever, whatever comedian, I don't know who, you know, people love. I mean, I'm on a Norm McDonald kick, rest in peace. I love the guy. Like he's just like edgy and terrible and fantastic. So I'm on a Norm McDonald kick right now, right? Watching him or, you know, Mitch Hedberg, you know, some of the other just like really unusual comedians. The point is I'm on a poster in the window of a comedy place in Warsaw. Now, what do I do? Like, what does this look like? Like I'm going to walk in, I'm not a stand up comedian. People are showing up to the comedy club expecting A, the comedian, B, the American, who they assume speaks Polish, right? So I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I walk into this comedy club. Oh, great, happy to be here. You're here in the show. Here's the showroom. You know, walk on in. And I walked in and you talked about wanting to turn off your phone 10 minutes before I showed up. And I'm the least intimidating person that you're probably going to have on the podcast in, you know, in, in some time. I walked in to this comedy club and I thought, how how could I cease to exist immediately and have no one notice, right? And I'm not talking about like, I'm going to throw myself in traffic. I'm like, how could I never have existed? Is there some way that I could not be born immediately? Uh, and, and, and people start coming in for the show and the room fills up with people who are there to see the show and they introduce me. You're like, of all the time, I'm going to sell out a crowd. This has to be it. It's unbelievable. Like, what am I going to do? Like, I don't speak Polish. What is happening? I mean, talk about terror. So, you know, here's what ended up happening. I walked out and I said to the audience, how many people here speak English? And of course, you know, it's, it's a misgiving on my part to assume that they didn't. 
People in, in, throughout the world speak English as a second language, at least in part, oftentimes, and certainly in Warsaw, you know, and so a lot of people raised their hand and other people didn't, and other people were like, ah, eh, so much. I said, well, here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is we've got a lot of time. The bad news is I don't speak Polish. I'm going to speak slowly, and I'm going to, I want to make sure that everyone understands, and if anyone misses anything, somebody please let your friend know in Polish what I said so that if it's funny or interesting or insightful, they don't miss out. Everyone's like, Cool. I'm like, is it okay if we just wing it and go for it? And they said, cool. And I just started telling funny stories and I did whatever it was, 45 minutes. I don't even know an hour. I have no idea, but it certainly wasn't, you know, comedy hour. It was yeah, you funny. Need add, you need to add that to your LinkedIn stand up comic. <laughs> stand, -up comic. <laughs> stand up comic, but only in Warsaw, only, in, only in Poland. It was uh that was a wild night. And I remembered I got done with that. And uh, I went to see uh, some friends, some friends throughout Warsaw and, People were like, what'd you do? Why are you here, Greg? What, what'd you do? And I said, I just performed at so-and-so. And they're like, that's the comedy club. I'm like, I know. I have no idea what just happened in my life. But it went well, and people were very happy with it. So it was, it was fun. The point, though, is when I am right before a keynote now or a presentation, and I have that momentary moment of that momentary just shiver of, oh, my gosh, I'm nervous or something like that, I think back to the literal 30 seconds before they brought me on at the comedy club in Warsaw. And I'm like, all right, I'll get through this. Whatever. Yeah, I can handle that. I know whatever. Right I mean, whatever this is, I'm in Detroit, like how, how bad is this going to be for a conference or something, whatever in Seattle or something, you know, I'll survive. If I survive the comedy club in Warsaw, I can get through just about anything. So, yeah. So I was army for 25 years, went to lots of countries. I still travel. I went to Vietnam last in September for 10 days. Even in Afghanistan, I've still I've not been a country where I said, "Man, these people suck or these people harbor." Right. Right. Even Afghanistan, as bad as it was, the people are great people. I've ne never been in a country where, like, man, these people are outstanding. They're great. Like, you don't yeah. meet bad people anymore. You you don't. And you know what? There's always going to be people who are bad in oh, yeah. the world. Rare exceptions. Most people want their kids to be healthy and all the things I listed off before. And you know, you go to places around the world that traditionally are not quote unquote the best. And you're still going to be able to find good people, even if you find a greater preponderance of bad people or greater ratio of bad to good or whatever it might be. There was a moment where I had, I had uh, gotten lost while driving on one of the trips I took to Haiti. And I'm on my way through Haiti. I need to get to the airport. And I'm driving this beat up rented car that I rented from a guy at a gas station. Uh, think about that for a moment. I didn't rent it from Hertz. I didn't rent it from Budget. I didn't rent it from Enterprise. I rented a beat up Toyota Tercel, Tercel from a guy at a gas station who said, yeah, I got a car. You want it? Yeah, it's a hundred bucks US a day. I'm like, oh man, I can only do 50. He's like, nope, hundred. I'm like, all right, fine. He's like, pay me in advance in cash. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. Bring the car back to the airport on Thursday. I'm like, all right, whatever. Hands me the keys. The dude walks away. So now I've got this guy's car in Haiti that I literally rented at a gas station. I'm driving it around Haiti. I need to get back to the airport on Thursday to get to my flight and to get the guy's car back, right? So I'm driving through Haiti and I end up driving into an area called City Soleil. City Soleil is arguably, at, and it has been at one point, one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in, in, in the hemisphere. It's, it's not safe and certainly not now, my gosh. But even then, it did not have a good reputation. This is post-earthquake. There was a lot of lawlessness there. And I'm in City Soleil and I'm driving by myself. What am I going to do? I have to get to the airport. I don't know how to get to the airport. I've gotten lost. I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I just started pulling over. And there was like a couple of guys on the side of the road. I pulled over and I said in my very broken French, excuse moi, excuse me, where's the airport? And these guys looked at each other like, dude, what are you doing in this neighborhood? And they just kind of like pointed like that's the way to go. So I would drive up the road another kilometer or two. I'd find somebody else, excuse moi, and then people are like, whatever. Yeah, it's that way. No one tried to kill me. I mean, and granted, sure, people do get killed. No one tried to rob me. Yes, people do get robbed. But it was an amazing moment because they had every ability to, you know, to, to, to pull me out of the car or do whatever they were going to do. But why are they going to do that? They're not necessarily bad people just because they live in downtrodden or difficult conditions. So I agree with you that anywhere you go in the world, you're going to find good people if you look for them. So next, tell a story of your recent trip to New York City. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so New York was great. So the book, uh, Reclaim the Moment, Seven Strategies to Build a Better Now, is out now on, on uh, publishing, uh, published by Wiley. And the, the book was showcased in a window display at Barnes & Noble in New York City. And what that means, basically, is they have a large digital display with a photo of the front of the book, and then they've got a, you know, copies of the book in the front window, and you can go inside, and there's a table full of books. 
Well, a friend of mine posted that he was walking down Fifth Avenue and he bought a copy of the book from the window display. And I thought, I got to see this window display. So I flew to New York and got to New York. And a friend of mine texted me and said, hey, what are you doing this week? I said, oh, I'm actually flying to New York. She said, my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm in New York too. I said, great, do me a favor. I want you standing outside this bookstore and turn on your, your phone camera. It doesn't have to be an elaborate production. I'm going to walk up to that bookstore sometime around 1215. And when I do, don't say hi to me. Just capture my reaction. Because I'm going to see my book in a window display of a bookstore for the first time. And I want to capture it. So the video that I posted in response to this, which is on my Instagram and, and uh, certainly all over the place, is this video of me flying to New York, walking down Fifth Avenue, going to the Barnes & Noble, seeing my book on display in the window, and then going into the bookstore and starting to sign books. Not because it was an official book signing. It wasn't anything set up like that. I just walked in and started autograph, asked if I could autograph some books. They're like, you're the author? I'm like, no, I'm some random guy. I just want to sign, I want to sign my name into you know, into, you know, copies of Harry Potter, whatever. No, I was like, I just want to, I'd like to autograph these. And they, Barnes and Noble people were overjoyed. Like, this is fantastic. Sure, come on in. And, and, and we took photos and it was a lot of fun. And what was cool was that people would walk up <laughs> seeing that I was signing these books and they'd want to know what the deal was. And I said, well, I'm the author. And like, oh, cool. I'll buy this book. Yeah. Or I saw it in the window. I came in to buy it. You're the author. Will you sign mine too? It was pretty nice. fun. It made me feel like a rock star for about 14 minutes. It was pretty neat. So money well worth spent, money and time Absolutely. well spent. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, because the thing is, you know, you put out a book and it's filled with stories about ways that we can get back on track when we've been thrown off track by the world. And, and what space can we create when we focus, when we dive into relationships, when we step into the unknown and have confidence, we create space for opportunity. All those ideas are in the book. Cool. I think those are good ideas. To see it in physical form is really cool. To see people responding to that is pretty cool. To sure to see the bookstore window is neat, but to have people come in and be like, hey, my daughter and I are from Australia. We saw this in the window. This looks really neat. And I said, yeah, it is really neat. I'm the author. Oh, my God, you're the author. And they freak out. It was, you know, it's, it's kind of fun. It was like a little ego boost, sure, but it was also affirming because the writing of the book wasn't a process where I started at point A and got to point B with utmost confidence, I started at point A with sketches on pieces of paper and where am I going and what am I doing and ended up with a printed book in front of us right now through the most circuitous route of excitement, confidence, self-doubt, questioning myself, being unsure, being amazingly confident, and then just going for it regardless, which is also a chapter in the book. It's, it's about that as well. The point is seeing it in physical form, in people's hands, mind-boggling. So from the time you first had an idea for a book to the date it was published, how long was that? Uh, a, year, a year, basically a year, okay. about 300 Is, is that like normal for a book to be you written? Know what? I, don't, I don't know. I think, that, I think if people write books quickly. Uh, Wiley asks of its authors that they write reasonably quickly. I mean, I, I had about four months to write the book, and then I refined it and refined it and refined it and refined it. So it, I think that you know people write at different rates of speed. Some people are, say they can write a book in a weekend. I can't guarantee that's going to be a good book if it's written in a weekend. It took a lot of going over again and again and again for me to get through this and get to this and what it is now. But I would say, you know, if, if somebody was interested in writing a book, don't try to write it as fast as possible. Try to write it as well as possible. Because when I was writing on Wiley's deadlines, first 20,000 words, second 20,000 words, third 20,000 words, so on and so forth, I, I found that the quality wasn't there. It was only when I went back and said, oh, hold on one second. I'm going to dive into this and rework this and spend some time with it that, uh, that I got the quality that I wanted finally. So again, it goes back to the value system we talked about earlier. You know, we, we, we value things for what they're worth here. We value things for efficiency and time. And I think that the, the time is better spent not being uh, efficient and rapid with the book, but being effective and, uh, and and taking time over time to craft something that has value and, and meaning behind it. Can you talk some about how you got your book deal? Like how you convinced Roddy to bring you on and like yeah. pay you all the money they paid you? Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, it's was, it was, it was fascinating. I, I knew somebody who ended up working at Wiley. And, you know, the old saying of it's not what you know, it's who you know. I am the embodiment of that in this situation. I knew somebody who worked, they're no longer at, but they worked at Wiley. And when they got their job at Wiley, they were in acquisitions and they were asked to find some authors. And they thought to themselves, oh, wow, I had a conversation with Greg six years ago about a book idea. 
I wonder what he's doing. And they looked me up online and saw a tagline at gregbenick.com and a photo and the words build a better now. And they got in touch with me. They wrote to me, which is unheard of. This is so ridiculous. It's literally like if you and I decide to form a band five minutes from now and it's called Jason and Greg rock the house and Sony records calls when we're walking out of here in a half an hour or whatever. It's, it's unheard of, right. That Wiley called me, but they did. And I, put together a book proposal for the concept they, that they wanted. I didn't have an idea to write this book. They came to me because of a tagline on my website and, and basically dropped this book in my lap or the concept of it. And then, yeah, we signed a contract and I wrote a book. It's, it's unbelievable to tell the story, but it actually happened. And so what's your, your, like your goal or intent for the book? Uh, I want to sell you that copy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, um, I only brought one. I brought my own copy of the book today. The point is my goal with the book is to have conversations about the book. My goal with the book is also to have people respond to the ideas in the book. And I even say, spoiler alert at the end, get in touch with me, tell me what the book meant to you. So I, I wanna have conversations about it. I would love to have people read it. It's done well so far as an Amazon bestseller and it went to number two in business management, which is interesting because ultimately it's a personal development book more than it is, I think, a business book. But it, it's a book which talks about creating space and opportunity for us. So. It's, it's interesting that what I really want is not to sit on piles of gold as a result of this book selling. I would love to have conversations with people about the book. I think that'd be fascinating, absolutely fascinating. We had great conversations, great connections, great keynotes. I would love to be speaking more about the ideas in the book. And I found that that's been true as well. Like this morning, the, the keynote that I did this morning was all about the ideas in the book. I mean, every attendee got a copy of the book. It was all about the ideas in the book. So I'd love to have more speaking opportunities like that. And how do you or Raleigh determine the price of the book? How does that work? Yeah, I'm not sure. There's there's some, there's some uh, I'm sure, actuarial mechanistic determination based on the, the price of things uh, that determines what, you know, what a book... Uh, what a book costs, what it sells for. I have no idea, but it's not up to me. Meaning it's, okay. it's not that I say that's a $28 book. In my opinion, I would love for it to be a $4 book. So more people could buy it. It would also be awesome if a lot of people bought it and it was a $375,000 book. Uh, but it's just like, I'm perfectly happy with whatever the, the, the current market price is of books, if it falls into that. So. And if you can't answer this, no, no, no worries. But yeah. <laughs> As far as economics, did like did y'all negotiate? Like you get like ten percent of the book sales, like no, a certain advance, something like that. No, no, that's a great question. And you know, and and what I can say is that you know, the, Wiley offered me an advance to write the book. It, that it was not an advance that I'm going to retire on. Meaning they didn't drop a half a million dollars in my lap. I'm not Stephen King. I'm not Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if those guys get seventy five million dollars to write a book or whatever. I mean, I'm sure they do quite well on book sales. But there was negotiation points along the way. So if somebody's interested in writing a book. Uh, there's there's something that's really interesting to consider, which is, do you go traditional, meaning a traditional publisher like Wiley, an established publisher, or do you go non-traditional? And if you go non-traditional, uh, are you going to self-publish or go with a hybrid publisher? There's a number of options to go. They all have their advantages and, for lack of a better word, disadvantages. Uh, and I negotiated based on the advantages that Wiley offers. One of the advantages that they offer is that this book is available literally everywhere through their distribution chain. Now, that doesn't mean it's sitting on bookshelves everywhere. It means that bookstores can get it everywhere. If you walk, a friend of mine, not even you, if a friend of mine walked into a bookstore in Reykjavik, Iceland about uh, three weeks ago and said, can you get Reclaim the Moment, Seven Strategies to Build a Better Now? They looked it up and they're like, oh yeah, okay. If you put out your book yourself and you don't have the benefit of that distribution chain and my friend goes in and asks about it, they're going to have to Google, they're going to have to find you. It's a whole shenanigans. That's not going to happen. That said, that's what I wanted. I wanted the book to be accessible anywhere. So if you're in London, if you're in Singapore, if you're in Reykjavik, if you're in Tacoma, you can get this book through a bookstore, a local bookstore, an independent bookstore, of course, through the Amazon overlords. It's, 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 it's possible to get the book everywhere. Now, given that level of accessibility, I was willing to make compromises that somebody else might not make given different conditions. Wiley is basically saying to me, this book's going to be available everywhere. And then I say to myself, okay, well, I'm willing to sacrifice the number of free copies I get because whatever, we'll figure it out. I'm willing to sacrifice maybe my author cost per book and having that be a little higher if it means 
my book's available everywhere. It's going to have a cover that I get to choose and that I want. The paper quality is going to be good. The number of pages, you see what I'm getting at? So there's negotiation points. If you put a book out yourself, you get to make all those choices yourself. You get to go with whatever printer you want. You get to go with whoever you want to put out the Jason Kavnis book. The other side of the coin is if somebody walks into a bookstore in Reykjavik, are they going to be able to order it? Are you going to be shipping books to Iceland yourself? So there's a lot of trade-offs. And, and schools out on whether or not one is better than the other. I like this a lot, yeah. but I got to say that my friends who are self-publishing have things about their publishing experience that I'm like, oh, wow, that's kind of neat. But I love Wiley, and I, this experience has been quite awesome. Is it going to be a second book in your future? Yeah, I would love to write a second book. I'm, I'm, I'm working on and have been working on a biography on a cultural anthropologist named Ernest Becker for many years. I'm fascinated by Becker's work. I know a lot about his life, his work, his research, his his academic history, I know a lot about Becker. So I want to do a Becker biography. That would be a book that I, 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 I'm not sure where that ends up. I mean, if Wiley wants it, they're more yeah. than welcome, but I can't imagine it's going to be a mass market book. And maybe it is depending on how I spin it, because I might very well spin it in a way that makes it accessible to everyone. Um, we'll see where it ends up and I'd be happy to, you know, to, uh, to have it exist in the world. So that's going to happen. And then uh, I have some other ideas for follow-up books uh, to this one in particular that I would, uh, Love to have in the same family as that one because I've been pretty happy with it. So does Raleigh or someone give you updates on book sales? Like they tell you, hey, your book sold 25,000 copies in Detroit, Michigan. Let's yeah. take you to Detroit and do some kind of speaking engagement. Yeah, I mean, they they don't necessarily do that, but it's not out of negligence, but rather out of the fact that I'm not Stephen King or Malcolm Gladwell, right? They're not going to call me and say, Greg, your book's just sold 5 million copies because I don't think this book will sell 5 million copies. I would love it to. If anyone would like to, please buy 5 million copies. The point is, is that if, they, if, they, if, they, if they sell that many, that's fantastic. But I'm also realistic about the fact that the numbers don't matter as much to me as long as the book's getting out and as long as I'm telling people about it. That's the most important thing and why I've been filling my social media with content about the book. Uh, I just want to keep getting the ideas out there and keep getting in front of keynote speaking audiences with opportunities that the book creates. I think that's really important to me. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the sales numbers are important. Yes, I want Wiley to make all of their investment back. That's going to be a fantastic day. We'll all celebrate. I then want them to make profit on the book, too. They're more than welcome to profit off me. Hallelujah. I just want to keep getting the word out in an organic and authentic way as much as possible so that People buy the book not of any out of, out of any sense of obligation, but because they want to experience the stories and the fun and the ideas and the concepts that I share in it. Hey, Greg. So it's four thirty-seven. Do you still need to get out here at four forty-five? It would probably be helpful. Let's let's do that. That's okay. that's a good length for people to listen to. Okay. I think it's okay. quite awesome. So next, um, what does it mean to cut through just distractions? Uh, that's an awesome question. So we live in an, an extraordinary complex world. It doesn't take me, Greg, explaining that for people to know it. We live in an unbelievably complex world. And cutting through distractions to me is about focus, and it's about focus in the moment on what matters most. You know what? I would love to call my mom today. I'm not going to do that while we're talking. I would love to call my partner today. I'm not going to do that while we're talking. I would probably love to uh, to go out and, and see what opportunities are available uh, for me to rescue a stray cat. That sounds of interest. Uh, skydiving might be fun to do again. I'm not going after those things mentally. I'm focused on this. I talk about all throughout the book, the idea that if we can cut ourselves free from distractions, we create possibility. And, and we create possibility for connections to be made, for conversations to be had. And I think that's really valuable. So the ideas throughout the book, each of the chapters on believing in the possibility of kindness, when instead of thinking that everyone's out to get us, we open up the possibility that the person who's about to do an interview with us might actually have the best of intentions. All of a sudden, we open up possibility for an amazing connection to happen. When we dive into relationship building, the same thing is true. When we dive into you know, our, our personal health and sharing ideas that we hear from others and connecting with them about ideas, possibilities are, are, are available to us for creation that otherwise wouldn't exist. And with that in mind, cutting through distractions create possibility. Cutting through distractions is about really focusing in a moment and making choices in a moment about what in that moment is most important. We as choice-making creatures have an ability that is relatively unique in the animal kingdom. We get to decide in this moment that we're going to focus on this rather than just running out the street and chasing after a truck. We're going to actually sit here and have a conversation to completion. And in that, making that choice in this moment, we create space for new things to be created and experienced.
what if somebody wants to cut cut through distraction, but they lack the discipline to do so? They, but they lack the, the discipline. discipline to do so. Here's what I would suggest. Either one of us could probably answer the question, when was the last time you went to the gym in a very creative way? You've been there recently. Uh, the point is... De is that, define recently, right? Yeah, define <laughs> recently. If we wanted to establish the discipline that neither of us say have for going to the gym, what we would do is do something, a little bit of something. If we wanted to be smart, if we said, that's it, we're going to the gym every single day, I bet we probably wouldn't do that, right? But I'll tell you this, you know, later on tonight, I'm going to end up at the Mariners game. Rather than drive, I'm going to walk there. Why? Because I think it's a good idea to walk a few miles each way. I think it's a healthier choice. Nice walk it's too. a nice walk, too. It's great. That said, choices like that over time become a discipline or rather a habit that gets ingrained. And I start thinking to myself, even as I was driving here today, you know what? I wish that I had taken a little bit more time to ride my bike. That would have been fun. You start to build your own discipline. The lacking of discipline is temporary. Lacking of discipline is a choice-making procedure. And we have the ability, as I mentioned, to make choices that result in different eventualities. We can change our future by building a better now through the choices that we make. And we can establish discipline over time by making small choices today. We don't have to engage with discipline in a massive way. We can start making smaller choices today. Off subject, are, are you like a big Mariners fan? Uh, I'm a I'm a substantial Mariners fan. Oh, yeah. I am. Yeah, I have to say, so I'm from Texas. My to my team is Houston Astros. So I have to say, the Mariners, Mariners fan base has to be the most loyal fan base in the history of <laughs> sports, right? I'm yeah. like this, y'all. Don't you have like the number one pitching staff in the in the? Like, we have the number one pitching staff in baseball. And you had like a yeah. seven game lead, and now it's like. We, we, we had at one point a substantial lead and we have lost the lead. And it, it's, it's like it, every year I'll go to this every year. It's yeah, like, to be a Mariners fan is a testament to discipline. It's oh, yeah. a testament to focus. It's a testament to devotion. Mariners fans are a specific breed who handle and manage disappointment with grace. Yeah. I yeah. tip my hat to you, sir. <laughs> Every year, yeah. Every year. <laughs> last year, y'all didn't. I think I made the playoffs last for the first time, like in twenty years or something. It was. It was a couple of years ago. We made the playoffs. Cal Raleigh hit a bottom of the ninth home run, and it was. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll replay the moment for you in, in a sense. In that, it's down to the last pitch. Basically, Cal Raleigh hits a hits a home run, wins the game for the Mariners. I turned to somebody who was standing next to me watching the game, who I'd met just earlier in the evening. Mm -hmm. And we held each other and wept. <laughs> we wept openly. Okay. So yes, they haven't made the playoffs in many, many, many yeah. years. They made the playoffs and then that playoff hope failed. Uh, this year we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. Like I said, all a dedicated fan base. We are dedicated fan base. Yeah. One thing, like, like I, I can't watch baseball on the on the TV, but I love going. I, I go at least four or five Mariners games a year. Right? That's I just cool. like I just like atmosphere. You know, just the place is like what half a mile walk from here too. You know, no, it's easy. It's easy from here. Absolutely. And there's like a day game at, at one o'clock on a Wednesday. Oh, it's fantastic! It's really great. I'm sure we'll go to a game sometime. I love I love seeing the games live. It's great. So next, your book talks a lot about focus. My question is, can you be focused on more than one thing? I think, I think it's possible to be. I think the idea of multitasking is overrated. I think that multitasking is not as effective as people think it is. So yes, it's absolutely possible and, and it needs to be, right? I mean, I'm not just about the podcast today. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, later on tonight, I'm going to, you know, see my friend, we'll have dinner, go to the game, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean that I'm focusing on that specifically, but we have different initiatives that come in and leave our focus, come into our, our priority and leave our priority throughout the day. The, the, the question is, though, can we keep our eye on one that is the most mission critical in front of us, even for an extra second or two, or an extra minute or two, an extra hour if need be, in order to get that thing accomplished, to have that thing, whatever it might be, seen through to completion or seen through to its next, to its next extra step so that we push the pawn forward a little bit, to use a chess metaphor. Because if we don't, we end up getting distracted, not moving any pieces at all, because we're going in so many directions at once. I think it's possible as a decision and choice making creature, again, relatively unique to the animal kingdom, to rationally think about the choices ahead of us and make them accordingly so that we build a better future through building better now. So I'm guessing this has to do with focus also. There's a chapter in your book titled Keep Your Eye on the Knife. Yeah, it's totally about focus. It's a juggling metaphor. And basically what I'm saying to folks is if you've got two beanbags and a knife and you're juggling, <laughs> you get it. We're going to keep your focus. Yeah. Right? You're going to keep your eyes <laughs> on the knife. Exactly. So 
with that said, it's so important to keep our eyes on the knife and making sure that the thing that is is going to impact us the most if it falls or fails, that that thing is where our focus is. So again, the chapters in the book, keep your eyes on the knife, leap into the dark, which is, you know, a, you know, a, a chapter about stepping into the unknown and, and, and embracing essentially the possibility that you might succeed. All of these chapters are about ways to sure focus, but also to perform effectively so that we can create opportunities and, and possibilities for ourselves. And also, I found somewhere where you talk about creating a space. Can you talk about that, creating space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, this, you know, I mentioned it a few times that we create space for possibility when we carve out distractions, when we work in relationship with other people, when we work together as a team, when we communicate more effectively, when we are better leaders and essentially, you know, guides for other people's experiences, we create space for possibility in others and create space for ourselves. Really, ultimately, I think life is better lived when we have the space to do and, and experience the things that we want to do. So um, who are your mentors? That's a great question. My gosh, John Wilson, who I mentioned before, John Wilson, absolutely top of the list. John is, uh, is, is again, I mentioned before, he's the genius you've never heard of. He's, he's brilliant. And he is uh, a local guy here, former professor at Cornish College of the Arts. And John, if he heard me talking about him being a mentor, he'd be very upset with me. He always corrects me and says, we're friends. You're not, you know, my mentee, but he really is. I think that uh, he's, he's taught me a lot. His perspectives have been invaluable in shaping the way I think about things. And I also have mentors who are long dead, meaning Ernest Becker, you know, the cultural anthropologist I, I, I spoke about writing about is, is a mentor in a way too, and he hasn't been alive in 50 years. So uh, his work is, is a guide. The way he thought was, was a guide for me, the way he thought about the role of the individual in society and what our, our, what our desires are and, and why we do the things we do and why we're so inclined towards war and destruction. Why is it that, that we are who we are? fascinating. There's a mentorship relationship there, even though he's been dead since essentially right around the time I was born. So, so next part of the question, to me, the most important part, who are you mentoring right now? That's an amazing question. You, you got the slam dunk questions today. <laughs> this is great. So I, I, uh, I mentor in, in a, in a non-official way, speakers and presenters who have questions about their presentations. So for example, a friend of mine in New York, had some questions this last week when I was there about some video content that he wanted to make that was going to be very funny. And he had some funny ideas and he's got a, a legacy of being funny. Uh, but he had some questions about punching up the punchlines essentially of his videos. So that was a situation where I thought, okay, listen, let me come to you from the perspective of years on stage from one side of things, not from the video side of things and see if my expertise maybe can help. That was an example. I mean, that's more friends working together, but I'm often talking to other speakers and people who are coming up in the industry who maybe don't have the stage time that I have, or they don't have a book, that sort of thing. I'm talking to people often about book ideas or talking to them about uh, stage experience that they want to have and helping them so that they can, um, they can, they can grow into who they want to be. I mean, I also, of course, have clients and I'm coaching people at times on different things and, and doing those sorts of uh, that, having that relationship with people. But the mentee thing, I see almost more on the friend side in a way where you're really kind of being somebody's guide. Yeah. That makes sense. So here's something that's weird about me too. At least I think it's weird, right? So I, 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 I can get in front of people, talk, whatever, like, like the AMC, whatever, no problem. But like, I cannot practice in front of anyone, right? Like, like if you said, like, pose you, I told, hey, hey, Greg, I'm doing a speech tomorrow. Yeah. Hey, Jason, want to go in? I'm like, no, I can't do it, right? Yeah. I, like, I, my wife, kids, I cannot rehearse it for anyone. I just, I, I just, it's hard. I, I just shut down, right? Now, five minutes later, probably in front of random people, yes, yeah, no problem, but I can I cannot rehearse in front of strangers, friends. I can't it's do hard. it. It's hard. It's hard to do because the thing is, let's say I have an idea for a speech called uh, Jason and Greg Go to the Moon, and I start practicing it in front of my friend Cameron. And Cameron's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, dude, 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 hold on, hold on. The idea isn't totally developed yet. The idea is that Jason and Greg go to the moon. Okay, what does that mean? Stop, stop. Let me just get through the rehearsal. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're questioning yourself. Yeah. I mean, the thing is. And they I, say, say this, don't do that. Yeah, and I say this in my keynotes. We are all insecure, frightened, terrified creatures. We're all hurtling towards an uncertain end. And if somebody says, your beard's too long, your beard's too short, we start thinking, oh my gosh, should I grow my beard? Should I cut yeah. my beard? We, we're all out of our minds that way. So rehearsing in front of people is tough. Uh, but if you can get rehearsal time in, it's really valuable. And that's true for whether you're writing or whether you're speaking or leading or communicating or being 
part of a team, I think getting your rehearsal time in and, and, and thinking about things before it's go time is really important. So Greg, I know we have to get here pretty soon. Is there anything that's for Ashley that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Well, I mean, we talked about coins, jumping out of airplanes. We talked about traveling around the world, speaking. Scuba diving. Scuba diving. We talked about the transformation of ritual to theater, which could have been 10 hours on its own. Your We've, comedy experience. Yeah, the comedy experience in Warsaw that I'm going to have to go get a therapist to have a therapy experience to deal with the comedy experience. That was terrifying. I mean, that was a terrifying, but I'm so glad I got through it. Uh, yeah, so we, we talked about all these things. I think this has been a great experience and we talked about the book yeah. chapters in the book and if people are interested in finding out more about me or about the book uh you can go to you know greg benick g-r-e-g-b-e-n-n-i-c-k.com of course and then uh you know the book is available at you know independent bookstores uh online and then also of course amazon wherever people want to buy books and i would just love to have people pick up a copy of the book and then and engage with ideas about it so i would love that so if someone's listening to this or watching this and they say man i want to know how to be a comic from greg how do they reach out to you? How, they they want to be, how, how do they get in touch? Yeah. They want to learn how to be a comic yeah. in, in, in Warsaw specifically. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I have a lot of expertise in that. Uh, they can get in touch with me. Uh, Instagram at Greg Benick, G-R-E-G-B-E-N-N-I-C-K and direct message me. LinkedIn, if they're on LinkedIn, happy to talk to folks via LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook as well. They can search for me there. And then of course, gregbenick.com is a contact page. They can get in touch with me there too. So I'd be happy to hear from anybody anytime. Hey, Greg, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. You're the king. This has been absolutely awesome. Thanks. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.